So there we go. So I figured when life gives you lemons, make some lemonade. So we're gonna make some mean lemonade today. And we're gonna use me as an example. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of information first about the type of cancer that I was just diagnosed with. And then I'm gonna give you a case study. I'm not gonna necessarily have my samples there. Maybe they will be mine. Maybe some of them will be mine, some of them won't be. But we will give you bite-sized information and you guys will use the knowledge that I'll give you in the first few slides to decide what stage it is, what grade it is, um, what type it is, and what type of pathways, hallmarks of cancers are affected in it, okay? That's what we're gonna do in the first part of class. And then you're gonna use the same type of kind of thinking method for your own presentations and do the same work yourself to create a pathway for your own presentations for your post. So as you know, the one that I was diagnosed with is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So here you have actually a lymphoma a uh, lymph node, it has this very glassy look and has a normal one, which has the typical normal morphology and does not have overgrowth of these B cells and all this craziness going on. And we'll talk about more of those morphological features in a little bit, ah, if it goes through. I have your chat in the corner. It's not in the most happiest of place. Let me move it around. Okay, so just some basics about this type of cancer. It is a hematological malignancy. So it's derived from mature B cells. Um, and they could be derived from multiple places within the lymph nodes, but a biggest uh, one of the biggest places that they see them in is the germinal center, um, where they work to respond to antigen and T cell stimulation. So they're a very important integral part of our immune system. When they turn neoplastic or when they turn malignant, they become larger than normal size and they kind of diffuse throughout the lymph node rather than staying where they should. And sometimes they'll even go to extra nodal sites, which means they will get out of the lymph nodes and they will get stuck in my case, for example, in the breast and then grow a tumor there or in another location and they will grow a tumor there. Um, and those solid malignancies are what we are looking at in this case. So these solid malignancies are traditionally classified as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you heard of Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is one of the most curable cancers, and then non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is also a very curable cancer, thankfully, but it is um, a little bit less than the, non, uh, the Hodgkin's one. Um, the funny, sad, whatever thing is that typically the median age for diagnosis for this type of cancer is around 64, 65 years. And the overall cure rate, which is a good thing, is about 60% looking at all of them. It doesn't matter stage one, two, three, four, right? This is looking at very advanced cancer all the way to the low care grade, all of them combined. Um, and the five-year survival rate is around 74%, which is very good if you think about it in, that, in those terms that you're looking at all different types, all different grades at that time. These are ones that are, you know, some of them don't respond. Some of them are really advanced even without it. It is very common or most common in Hispanics um, and whites than in Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, so I am an atypical case. I'm also an atypical case because I am definitely not 64 years old. I'm sure you guys can figure that part out. Um, however, uh, this is something, and I do cancer research, but my research is mostly in solid malignancies, not in hematological malignancies. Uh, as I discovered through my own research in the last two weeks, Northeast Florida has one of the highest rates of this type of malignancy. So there's definitely something in our environment that we're getting exposed to that is raising the incidence of this cancer. And a lot of them are younger patients, um, even younger than me, in their 20s, in their 30s, at the prime health, fitness, and they are getting this type of cancer. So there's definitely something that is to be investigated in this environment that we are in. I don't know if it's the roundup they're using in the golf courses or something else in our environment, but there's definitely something that we should all be aware of and mindful of as we go through our life in this place. So what are some clinical manifestations of this? It's a very fast growing symptomatic uh, tumor once it starts. 
So many times you have what we call indolent lymphomas, which are low-grade tumors. They are not going to harm you. People would not even know anything about them for years, even decades, uh, for lymphomas especially, especially this type. But then one day when they switch, when that mutation, that critical mutation happens that causes them to switch to a more malignant, higher-grade form, they become extremely aggressive and extremely fast-growing. And usually they are first identified through a mass either in the neck, abdomen, or one of like your armpits, you know, lymph nodes, any of those things. They're seen with enlarged lymph nodes many times because again, it is a lymphatic system's cancer. It's a systemic cancer, not something that's just in one place. Um, you can isolate them um, in uh, to two main categories. So there are some that are called de novo. They are can be easily isolated through uh, because they were transformed from pre-existing lymphoid malignancies. Example, like an indolent lymphoma, which has been hanging out for a long, long time. Those are called follicular lymphomas. And others are where they just kind of happen because of a critical mutation to begin with. There was no prior malignancy hanging out in there. Um, so yeah, those are the two ways. The de novo, that just happened, or through transformation from pre-existing follicular lymphomas. 30% um, of the patients will have other symptoms that they would have already been maybe seeing their doctors for, like fevers, night sweats, weight loss. I didn't have the weight loss, but I did have night sweats. I did have fevers. I did have breathing issues that we were putting on low ferritin or low, you know, or COVID, post-COVID, whatever it was. Okay, so let's look at what it looks like morphologically. Again, all of you should have data in your presentations about something morphological about your condition uh, in there, and that's going to be part of your poster. So you want to make sure that you can walk us through those morphological things. So here is an image of a normal lymph node. You see that cells look very similar in size and shape, and they're homogeneously spread out. Um, a lot of these are B cells and they're hanging out in their space. They are nice, clean, round nuclei. There are no uh, weird shapes and they are homogeneously spread. A diffuse large B cell lymphoma, as you see in here, has much larger nuclei and they're becoming a little bit more haphazard in shape. They are not, become, they are not as nice and clean and organized as they were in a normal lymph node. If you look at a higher magnification of this, you can look inside these nuclei and you see not only a very disjointed structure inside, right? It's not like a typical nucleus anymore, is it? They have these empty spaces. They have nucleoli that are kind of big and small and misshapen. So there are a lot of features that show up in this particular slide that tells you that it doesn't look like a normal lymph node or a normal cell anymore. And again, the purple, the pink is the cytoplasm and the ECM area. These blue are your nuclei, okay? So these nuclei, just think about them. They look kind of like cells at this point. They're so big and large. And inside they have very, very uh, different structure than what you're used to seeing when you see a typical nucleus. Any questions so far? And by the way, on that note, was I even recording this? Yes, I was. Good. Okay, so here are those markers that we just talked about that morphological markers for a B-cell lymphoma would include large and atypical nuclei, which is what you see down here. They are misshapen. They are very different in size and they are diversified. They are not all the same uh, look, the same size, the same shape. They also have prominent nucleoli. So you see those really large nucleoli and really weird shaped nucleoli inside. And they have many nucleoli instead of just one or two, which is typical for a normal cell. And this one last thing, which is specific for, again, a lymphoma or a cancerous uh, culture, is the KI-67 index. KI-67 is a protein that is upregulated right before, right around mitosis. So this is going to be upregulated or overexpressed in cells that are undergoing mitosis. So many times people will look at KI-67 index to show that those cells are proliferating at a higher rate than typical. And so typically for a B cell lymphoma to be classified as an actual active lymphoma, they are looking for this index to be over 40%.
you can look at these markers morphologically, but you can also quantify them using specific techniques. So here I'm showing you a technique called PATS, Fluorescent Assisted Cell Sorting. Many of you would have found articles in your studies that will look at something like this to look for sizes and diversity of different cell types inside your culture. You should be able to read a graph like this and explain it. So in this case, <coughs> Usually you would have marked your cells, you know, you get a culture. So we got our B cell lymphoma culture, let's say you got um, a biopsy sample. You would have dispersed all those cells into a suspension. You mark them either with a dye for DNA. Usually we mark them with a couple of things, a dye to mark the DNA. So we know how much DNA content is inside the nuclei. And then we'll also typically mark them with some kind of antibodies to some specific markers we are looking for, right? For example, we know that all the B cells express CD20. Then we might bind them with an antibody against CD20 and look for what percentage of our cells have that marker, okay? So in this case, they are looking at CD45 expression, which is another marker for uh, B cell lymphocytes. And we are looking at the size of the cells. Now, um, you are marking them with two, again, two or three different things. We are looking at the fluorescence to see how much DNA content is there. We are looking at the size of the cells by looking at the you know, size of the actual cell that's passing through the laser. So with the suspension, what you do is once you mark them, you pass them through a laser so that one cell is going by at a time and the laser is gonna pass through and it's going to mark up the size, the shape, the um, markings, if it had the antibody bound to it or not, if the DNA, how much DNA was inside, all that good stuff. And so the smaller population of your lymphocytes, the typical size lymphocytes would be towards the bottom in this case, the larger lymphocytes are gonna be towards the top. So that's easy to see um, that in this particular culture, you have a lot more large lymphocyte than smaller lymphocytes. And here you see those misshapen larger lymphocytes compared to the normal typical ones. So when we do this kind of flow analysis, we look for, uh, do basically a combination of what we call the immunohistochemistry, where we are using antibodies to mark certain protein markers on our cells to examine if they are expressed on our cells. And we are also looking for the size of the cell, the shape of the cell, and the DNA concentration. Typically for DNA concentration, the bar, the graph will look something different. And I will show you an example of that as well. You'll have peaks and you will have a peak at a certain point that will be your 2N DNA content and a second peak at exactly twice as much fluorescence. And that would be your G2M concentration, right? Those cells that are uh, already replicated their DNA and they are doing the next step. So they are in the G2 phase or mitosis phase. <laughs> So for B cell uh, standard markers, we look for these uh, five different CD markers, CD19, 20, 22, 45, and 79, eight. CD20 is the main one that I'm gonna be focusing on because that's also a target for a therapy that we can get down the road. And then they also look for IgM expression in the cells and for typically for it to be marked as a diffuse large B cell lymphoma at least 50 to 75% uh, of the cells have to express the IgM. Okay, so that's just basically identifying what it is. Is that a cancer of the B cell lymphoma or breast or whatever, right? So that was for identification of the type of cancer. Next part comes as staging, what stage it is. To do staging, the typical gold standard is to run a PET scan of the entire body and to look for how much disease has spread throughout the body. And typically they are decided into, you know, for the most, at the most basic level, it's early versus late disease. And then typically you have stage one through four, sometimes higher. And then the last uh, subdivision within it is that within stage one, there'll be stage one, A through E, two, A through E, so on and so forth. So in early limited stage disease, you are looking at stage one or two. In this particular case, so I'm only gonna be talking about diffuse uh, B cell lymphoma staging, right? Each cancer will have a slightly different, different staging approach depending on whether it's a solid malignancy or a systemic malignancy. And remember, this is a systemic malignancy. 
So uh, in stage one, you only have one lymph node or one extra lymphatic site, but no lymph node involvement. So an example of that is right here in this particular stage one PET. They have one single lymph node. There's nothing else popping up. The bladder is always going to pop up because that's what's metabolizing the radiation they give you. So you'll always see the kidney, ureters, you know, all that good stuff. But and brain will always look up because the dye they give you, it's basically a glucose Radi radioactive glucose dye and brain is very glucogenic. Obviously it's always using glucose and you can't really shut it down. So your brain always just brightens up. But in this case, there's only one little node lighting up and that's it. There's no other extra nodal site. There's nothing else popping up. Everything else is fine. So this would be an example of a stage one disease. Similarly, if there was just one, you know, there was no node involved, but maybe a lump in the breast or a lump in the neck that would be another example of a stage one disease. A stage two disease would be a little bit more involved. So it would be two or more lymph node regions on the same side of the diaphragm, either right or left, with or without any extra lymphatic site. So here is an example of that, that you are on top part of the diaphragm, right? Left, right, doesn't matter, but it's just all on top half of the body. And they have some nodes, they have some tissue, right? They have some lung maybe involvement or um, cardiac involvement, but everything is above diaphragm, nothing below the diaphragm. And that again tells them that it is limited to some extent, a little bit more involved than this, but limited. And that would be an example of a stage two disease. The next, these both of these combined obviously would have a better prognosis because they're still limited. They are not spread too far. Um, compared to advanced stage disease. Um, so those are early or limited disease. Stage three and four will involve nodes and extra lymphatic sites on both sides of the diaphragm. So stage three would be that you have at least at minimum lymph nodes that are on both sides of the diaphragm. So they are both above and below. So diaphragm acts like a little barrier, right? So it has to kind of cross over and go somewhere else to be able to spread that far. And then stage four, <clears throat> is where you have a very diffuse involvement and things have gone all over the place, right? And you can see an example of that right here, which is um, quite spread out and quite metastatic in many ways. It's gone into the liver, it's gone into the spleen, it's gone into many, many lymph nodes on both sides. That would be an example of a stage four disease. Um, and this, even if they did not have any nodal involvement because they had so many organ systems involved would be stage four, okay? Any questions so far? You guys are good? Yeah, I mean, everything seems pretty good. Good, you okay. So last thing that we need to know before we actually look at the case study and make our own assumptions is the subtype identification that is used for prognosis. So the first two parts were just, what is it? what stage it is. Now we get to actual prognosis and treatment part of it. And for that, we need to know something about the molecular makeup of this disease. And so um, what we do for the subtype identification is that we run essentially several molecular analyses or genetic analyses to figure out where it came from, the pro probable uh, cell of origin, and then what type of molecular mutations it contains and that's gonna directly dictate what type of treatments are gonna be effective for it. And also it's gonna dictate what they called an International Prognostic Index or IPI. There is a revised version and there's an older version, there's a third version, whatever it is, but all of them have the same premise that based on the current therapeutics available, what is gonna be the four-year progression-free survival or four-year overall survival for patients with that type of mutation, with that age group, with that you know, for a probable cell of origin and all that good stuff. And those numbers are given as zero to one, which are low risk for progression, two, three, which are low or intermediate risk, four, five, high intermediate risk, and then six, seven, eight are really high risk, which would obviously be like stage four diseases. Okay, so um, this obviously is gonna require molecular analyses like the ones that we talked about, proteins, gene expression, looking at DNA, looking at whether things are mutated and whatnot. So in B cell, there are two different origins that they can happen in. Uh, about 40% come from germinal B cells 
And the remaining ones come from what they called activated B cells that were already on their way to transforming into the T antigen, right? With the uh, T cells. Those are um, usually a little bit more aggressive, by the way, than the germinal ones. Germinal ones are a little bit better prognosis comparatively. Similarly, uh, once you have categorized the probable cell of origin, there are three big mutations that have been seen multiple times in B-cell lymphoma, uh, or three different dysregulations, whether or not they're direct mutations or not, and those are BCL2, BCL6, and CMIC. If you've looked at the um, hallmarks of cancer stuff that we've been talking about, we've talked about BCL2 and BCL6 in which pathway? What's that an important part of? Which pathway is it important in? Who remembers? <coughs> Come on, guys, you can tell me. Not breast cancer. I'm talking about specific pathways related to hallmarks of cancer. So we've talked about dysregulated growth, genetic instability, apoptosis, right? Angiogenesis. Um, migration metastases. BCL2, especially, we've talked a lot about in certain modules. What is it that it is important in? It's important in all cancers, actually. Yes, exactly, apoptosis, and specifically in intrinsic apoptosis pathway. So BCL2 as well as BCL6 are integral part of the intrinsic apoptotic response. So if they are demutated or dysregulated, they are going to hinder that normal performance of the cell to recognize that it's damaged and die when it should die. Uh, on the other hand, CMIC, if you remember from when we talked about dysregulated growth, is an important protein uh, in which pathway? Who remembers CMIC? And again, this was also related to P53 and P21, MDM2, CMIC, PI3K. No, it's not part of the apoptotic pathway at all. It's actually part of the growth regulation pathway. It is a very important growth activator. It is one of those pathways that can activate growth. So if CMIC is upregulated, you would end up with dysregulated growth, even though you shouldn't have growth, okay? So those things you should keep in mind as we go through our actual case study sample. So just a reminder for the main hallmarks of cancer that are important uh, in the start, the origin of cancer, and then sustaining of that cancer. Uh, cancer never starts with just a single mutation, right? It starts with one thing makes it more susceptible to the second, makes it more susceptible to the third, but it's typically two to three mutations that get you to the cancer response. It's never overnight um, or rarely overnight. Uh, and one of the big things that is part of it is sustaining proliferative signaling that even when there shouldn't be any growth signal available, something happens to maybe a growth factor receptor or a growth factor itself that's always upregulated causing the cell to receive the signal that it should replicate and divide even when it shouldn't. Similarly, it could also be just a balance of power issue where the growth signals are still normal levels, but one of the growth suppressor activators is shut down or is the growth suppressor is not working anymore, that's mutated. And the balance is shifted artificially towards the growth signals, uh, even though they were still present at the normal levels. Later on, <laughs> the other thing is uh, very important in tumors as they start to grow is inducing angiogenesis. Tumors can only grow to a small a size, maybe one, two centimeters at most, even in the best conditions, without further increasing their blood vessel growth. And they do that by secreting signals towards the endothelial cells so that they can recruit blood vessels towards them and grow bigger and stronger and have a way out as well to migrate and metastasize. And so that's extremely important in their case as well. Again, in some tissues, you already have a lot of blood vessels and it makes it easier for them to grow. Breast is an example of that. So then sometimes they can go a little bit further before they induce their own. And finally, you have the resistance of cell death. They have direct mutations or indirect mutations related, leading to 
suppression or deactivation of the apoptotic pathways so that even though they should be dying, they are no longer dying. Okay. So uh, here we have our mass, our case study patient. They will have a rapidly growing five centimeter ill-defined heterogeneous mass on ultrasound. So we are first going to look at, oh, it opened the wrong site first. Why? Let's see. There. So they have positive for CD20, CD10, BCL2, and BCL6 by immunohistochemistry on the biopsy. They have KI67 labeling of about 40%, so barely at the cutoff, but they are there. 30% positive for CMEC overexpression and negative for several markers that are T cell related. So CD3, CD21, CD30, and MOM1 would have told that they were more T cell related. Uh, what do you think this patient has? You can write in the chat or you can let me know. Do you think they have a B cell lymphoma? Do you think it's germinal or uh, ABC activated or activated one, right? What do you think they have based on just that information? Germinal, good. And this one, because they had actually, you know, so this one part I did talk about, but not too much. They have some markers that are indicative with the CD20 and CD10, NBCL2, NBCL6. They have so many of them that also tells that they had had it for a bit. Um, it wouldn't have happened overnight that suddenly you have BCL2 and BCL6 and CMEC all together. It couldn't be a three triple hit at one time. So this tells them that it could be follicular and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There's a subcategory called Burkitt, which is related to CMIC, and they don't know whether that is the case in this one because CMIC, uh, uh, the Burkitt lymphoma has a much worse prognosis. And that one is usually because of a translocation. So part of the CMIC gene breaks off and goes to a different chromosome and gets very, very upregulated. And that's a really bad thing in that case. So for now, we don't know whether that's the case. What they would need to do run is a genetic study to look for that translocation to make sure that's not the case. Now let's look at, yes, it's germinal, that's good. So then let's look, is that a good thing or a bad thing that it's germinal versus ABC? As good as you can get in the current situation, that is. So what did we say? Was that gonna be a better thing? Yes, definitely. Okay, so now we get to the staging. So they do a PET scan and they see a hypermetabolic lesion in left breast and several left auxiliary lymph nodes. And I think there's an image of that right there. So looking at that, is it going to be on one side of the diaphragm or both sides? One side, good. Is that a good thing? Is that stage one or stage two? Why would it be stage two? Because there are multiple points and there, what important part is that there's an extra nodal site, right? It's not just in the nodes, it's outside the nodes and it's several nodes, exactly. It is not seen anywhere else in the body. That's a good thing. So based on this information, we know that it is two, but it is a pretty high two. Uh, because of the large extranodal mass with several nodes, but they are all involved on the same side of diaphragm, which is a good thing. Okay, so now we get to the IPI portion, especially because of the CMIC and the BCL2. So like I said, this was a very atypical biology in this case, which was a little bit annoying, unfortunately, but still, it's okay. It's actually worked out okay in the end. So the, for prognosis, they have to run some genetic analysis. And what they are using is what we call FISH analysis. analysis. It's fluorescent in situ hybridization. What they do is they stain the DNA in DAPI with blue. That's the blue nuclei. And then they take probes for specific genes, in this case, CMIC, BCL2, and BCL6, 
and they look for those mutations and they look for whether they are in one place, like in one chromosome, or they're multiply translocated or moved into different places. And so they can monitor them and they can see if they are getting a lot of those, you know, multiple signals. They have more than two light up for MYC or BCL2 or another one, right? So, and that's what you're looking at here. A double hit is if you have translocation or mutation in two of the three genes. That's a bad prognosis. A triple hit would obviously be even worse prognosis. And so uh, here is an example where they have a BCL2 mutation and a MYC mutation. That would be a double hit. Here is an example where they have a BCL6 and a MYC mutation. That would be a double hit. Or if you have all three, that would be a triple hit. Um, the BCL2 rearrangement is a hallmark of follicular lymphomas, but it can also be seen in the large B cells, especially with germinal centers like I have. Um, and then rearrangement of BCL6 is also seen in over 30% of DLBCLs. Uh, MYC is almost always seen with Burkitt, and that is the one that goes to the brain more likely as well and can be really, really bad prognosis because of that. Um, so in my case, what would you want to see? Would you want to see single, double, none? Single, double, triple, or none, depending on how much you like me, I guess. Yes, Definitely ideally not. you would wanna see none for sure. Okay, so yeah, so one of my biggest concern was with the CMIC that it would be Burkitt. Fortunately, when I got the results, there were no MIC rearrangements detected. There was no fusion detected. There was no rearrangement detected for BCL2 or BCL6, all good things. The only thing they did see was that there were three copies of BCL2 gene. So there was, a you know, obviously upregulation of that, there was a second copy, a third copy that shouldn't have been there. And because of that, 80% of my cancer cells show diffuse BCL2 staining on the IHC. BCL2, when it's in the cytoplasm, stops apoptosis. That's the bad part. So you have to somehow inhibit it to activate the apoptotic response. Um, and only 30% of my cells showed the overexpression of CMYC. Well, it's not through mutation directly or translocation directly on the CMIC, but obviously some pathway is disrupted that's causing that effect. But because of this, the good part was that it was stage 2E, but the IPI was only zero because the MIC was not there. And the CNS IPI, so it still had a chance because there's still 30% CMIC, was still uh, there, but still low. And the progression-free survival and the overall survival with my age group and the mutations was still looking pretty good. So thankfully that's the good part. Okay, so this is a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma of germinal origin, no double hit with three copies and overexpression of BCL2. And that's what we're gonna go in when we start to build the pathway. And that's where we get to our little nodes. Well, before that. So here is an example of what you would find for something like this already available. So in my case, right, I have the PI3K kinase pathway, which would upregulate CMYC. That's one of the growth regulation pathway. It would overexpress the growth signal. So the cells are always replicating and dividing. In addition, I have uh, the NF-kappa B activation most likely to induce survival mechanism which would lead to anti-apoptotic BCL2 family upregulation, leading to decreased apoptosis. So, you know, very, very sophisticated, elegant tumor, right? It knows how to get around. It wants to make sure that it not only grows, but also doesn't die. Uh, so you have to definitely hit it from multiple places. Yeah. There you go. So step one is identifying your nodes, which you all have already done. Nodes are genes or proteins that are affected by your supplement or affected by your disease. In my case, I'm starting off with the disease as my premise because that's what I'm giving you as my example. In your case, you're gonna be using all those things, both sides at the same time. What you would wanna do is in your very first step, and you can go along with me as we do this portion um, there, uh, you can take your 
data table that you have in your PowerPoints, right? Those you, uh, those little data tables that you made with your references and stuff, and you can copy and paste them into your uh, into an Excel sheet. And once you do that, you just want to keep the first two columns. Now, in my case, I know the expression level based on the IHC. In your case, you don't, and that's fine. You're just going to say up and down, up meaning that they were upregulated, there were more expression than typical, and down to indicate that they were downregulated or reduced expression. That's it. So you would have these first two columns, and then for your third column is where we are going to be adding in our protein identification numbers, unique protein ID numbers. Those are the ones that are going to go to reactome to figure out which networks are gonna be affected, okay? So step one is identifying nodes, which are genes and proteins affected by our supplement or by our disease. You already have those. You're gonna go ahead and copy paste them into an Excel and I'll show you how to get the Uniprot ID numbers. So uh, the link for that is also present, by the way, inside your uh, assignment for this week. Let me show you. We go to signal transduction, pathway schematic. On that note, remember there is a big quiz coming up this week. It is due, it says November 20th. I probably will extend it a little bit towards closer to Thanksgiving. But this particular quiz is kind of cumulative. It's critical thinking, okay? It has questions on um, in data interpretation, figuring out figure legends, this and that. Um, so a lot of critical thinking questions. Okay, so here we go. This first link, uniprot.org, uni, uh, that's the one that you will be using to figure out your uh, protein ID numbers, the unique protein ID numbers. We want to make sure that we have at least five genes or proteins, five nodes for our supplement. If you have at least three in your uh, disease, that's good enough. So that's step one. You're going to go in. Um, and when I go into my slide, this is my site, uniprod.id. Oh, Let me take you to that link and show you what you will do. Once you got in here, you're going to write the name of your proteins one at a time or genes one at a time, and just make sure to write human in front of it. So you get the human homolog for as many of them as you can. Some of them, you're not gonna get the human, and I purposely put the CD10 because you don't get CD10 pop up. But if you were to click on that first link and go down um, here, it will have a place where it will say alternate names and it will show you whether it is CD10 or not. I'll show you where it does that. Go back to names. Normally it looks up a lot easier. This one is just difficult. Names and taxonomy is where typically I see it. Sometimes it's not a human alternative. So, oh, come on, stop, 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 stop. Damn it. It's being weird. Fine, fine. Let it do what it's doing. I don't know what happened to it. It got possessed. Possessed, I tell you, possessed. No, it was programmed to us. Or maybe not. It was the program. Go away. I'll open it up again. You're only seeing the PowerPoint. You don't see my site. Oh, no. Okay, let me stop share and reshare. Sorry about that. The Uniprod screen was having a meltdown anyway. Okay. Can you see it now? For that one second that it was there, let me reopen it. Okay, so, you know, let's say something else. Maybe 20 human. And so sometimes, like I said, this is the first thing that's gonna pop up and you know that's the correct one. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you had the names from another organism, so maybe it won't pop up first thing in there and you have to look around. If you can't find it in here, you can always do a Google search for it and see what other names it could be 
uh, categorized under. You can also ask me, I can help you out with that as well. Um, you don't necessarily need every single one of them anyway, as long as you have at least five in your natural supplement and three in your other one, right? So BCL2, for example, let's do BCL2, human. And again, you know, this one pops up right away. Some of them don't. I want to pick one that doesn't pop up right away, but shows me. BCL6 pops up right away too. And it says BCL lymphoma 6 protein, like it's the perfect one. Um, see, Mick, KI67, let's try KI67. Yeah, so sometimes their name will be a little bit different. Sometimes they're not going to be the very first one. Um, let's try CD30. Usually, usually the CDs, because they are so conserved and so many of them will be the ones that get confused. So CD30, see right here, it says tumor necrosis factor receptor superfamily. But when you look at gene names, you see CD30 as one of the examples for that particular gene, and you know it's the correct one. So what you're doing is you're copying down this number. This is the number that you need for your reactome. Okay, so that's your step one. You're going to be combining and you're going to be looking up the names, the protein ID numbers, the unique protein ID numbers from this site. And you're going to be putting them into your Excel sheet like this with the Uniprot ID numbers. I always put the link for that protein in front of it because they have a lot of good information about that protein in there that can help you understand your pathways and understand your system a little bit better. It's written in very nice, clean format. So, you know, it's good to have that link in there as well. Do you guys see the Uniprod seat is screen now? I still hear no. Yes. Okay, perfect. So everyone good so far on step one of your project today? Yeah, okay. So how about we take 10 minutes here and you guys go ahead and look up on your end the same thing, right? Look up your Uniprod IDs. I'm gonna pause the recording, remind me to, restart it when we get to step two and I'll answer any questions you have as you're going through it and having any troubles with it. Okay. Okay, so everyone should have gotten some nice notes ready to go, some of these protein IDs ready to go. So now we're going to move on to, uh, well, make sure first that my share screen is working. Am I sharing screen yet? No, I'm not. There we go. So once you have these numbers, that's the next uh, The next step is going to be to now discover the major networks that are going to be associated with those chosen nodes. To do this, we are going to use an open source software called Reactome. And so what you're going to do is go to this open source software site. It's reactome.org. Again, the link for this is also provided in the assignment for this week. Um, reactome.org. If you go in here and go down further, it's going to tell you somewhere in there too. If not, it's just reactome.org. This is what it will look like. Um, again, it's a very cool software. It is open source, really available to all researchers across the globe. So it is used fairly easily and quickly by all of them to do pathway analyses like the ones we are going to do and very sophisticated ones as well. We're just going to do a very, very basic search. We're just going to kind of get a feel for it. But there are really sophisticated capabilities that the software has that allows us to look at really large data sets and do data mining from gene expression studies, microarray studies, all kinds of cool things, metabolomics, proteomics, anything you name it. It has several functions. It has this pathway browser where you can look at a specific pathway of interest, maybe P53 related or CMIC, apoptosis, whatever. It has the analysis tool, which is what we are going to be using. The pathway browser can be really overwhelming for students because it's going to give you everything related to that protein. So typically what we are going to use is analysis tool and then has another um, version of it, which is called Reactome Fevis, which is designed to find pathways and networks directly related to specific diseases or cancers. This is one where you download it on your computer, so you have to regularly update it for new updated information. But outside of that, it works super cool to give you specific information about your topic of interest. 
So we're gonna to go to the analysis tool for today. Once you click on the analysis tool, everyone able to see it? I wanna make sure you guys are playing along with me and are getting into the thing, perfect. So once you get here, you will notice that this opens up this little window. You know, it's again, very low frills, right? It's easy to uh, go through the software, which is great. On the left-hand side, there are these toolbars. It takes about, you know, you can analyze gene list, you can do gene expression arrays, you can do species comparison between different species if you were looking for homologs. You could do tissue distribution of a particular gene or protein or system that you're looking at. Uh, for our purposes, we are gonna do a very simple thing, right? We're using our Uniprot session list. It also has some example data. So here's an example data in there, right? They were, they're just using Uniprot session list and I could search and show you what it will show. In this case, this is for a glioblastoma, a brain tumor, very aggressive brain tumor data set. Um, you could put gene name list. You can use MCBI entries. These are all different uh, different search engines, different types of data annotated and data available for us out there that we can utilize as our basis for this analysis. So whoever has whatever way available, they can use it. Um, the only requirement is that all your data should be in the same format. So you can't have some gene names and some protein IDs, right? We wanna have every single node in the same exact format, which is what we were doing right now, was getting them all in the same format. We can also, instead of looking for genes or proteins as our nodes, use our supplements as our nodes. So if we had, for example, specifically, we wanted to look at safranel or crocetin or curcumin, those molecules also have unique ID numbers on different annotated websites like the CHEBL or KEG, which are for small molecules. And we could get those names and use those as our starting points as well. Here's another, here's an example of that as well where we can have a set of molecules that we are studying and those are the input that we put in. And then obviously, as I mentioned, we can do microarray data that we've generated from our own analyses, metabolomics data, proteomics data, anything like that. So what we are gonna do, however, is very, very simple, basic. We are gonna go ahead and get our protein IDs numbers. And now you know that for one of them, I do not have a code. So I just wanna delete that space when I get in here. I'm copying it, you know, control C copy and paste, control V. I'm just removing the space and I have my nodes in here. Once I put them in here, I'm gonna click on continue. It's gonna say, what do you want? I'm gonna say, I want to project it to humans. So even if by accident, I left one in mouse or C. elegans or whatever my study was, it doesn't matter. As long as I say project to humans, it's gonna take all known human identifiers and complement and find their complements in human equivalents. And that's what it's gonna use. So I had that, and then I'm gonna click on Analyze. So when you click on Analyze, you get to this window. This is the main window that you're gonna be looking at. Now in this window, you see all these concentric circles, right, with little branchings happening around them. Each circle is basically a network. A network is a group of pathways that are all related to a single function, cell cycle, program cell death metabolism, right? These are big functions, big functional networks in our body. And so our first goal is to identify three networks that are affected by our supplements when they're added into this environment with that disease that you're working with. So hopefully when you're combining those nodes, all of those nodes together, and you're inputting them, you should have certain areas within this picture light up in yellow or green. So I don't know how visible it is on your end from my screen. Hopefully it is uh, visible enough that you can see these yellow lines. Um, those are what I'm looking for is those yellow lines, okay? Uh, do you see them on my screen? Otherwise I'll show you in a slightly different variation in just a second. And when you input your numbers too, right? You, you input your notes and you click analyze, you should see certain areas pop up. Now, signal transduction, gene expression, tend to pop up all the time, right? Everything is a signal transaction pathway at some point somewhere. So you wanna avoid those initially. You wanna go for other things outside of that as your main networks. And you wanna pick the top two networks, the ones that most light up in your picture as your top two. 
So in my case, immune system definitely has a bunch of yellow lines. So I want to pick that. And then I have program cell depth. It has a very big area lit up. So I'm going to pick that. Those will be my top two. My third one is going to be a little bit of a feeling thing, right? You're going to talk with your partner. You're going to talk about your topic. You're going to think about what it is that you're trying to show through your conclusions, through your pathway analysis. And based on that, you will pick that third, a third network to show in your uh, pathway. So in my case, it's all about cancer cells and the drug efficacy for the different drugs that I'm going to get. So I'm most likely going to pick the cell cycle, right? That's a big part of cancer development and progression is the dysregulated cell cycle. So I'll probably end up picking that as my third network to show. So from, the, from your reactome, the biggest thing that I want you to get from there is your big networks that are affected by your supplements in response to those treatments, okay? Any more questions so for, for this part? Is everyone able to see something yellow in their networks pop up when they get to this window? Yes, no. So up here, there are three different ways that you can show this organization, right? I can do an open pathway diagram, for example. I can do a React foam. React foam sometimes is visually a little bit easier for students to see. It's not easy when you get to the next part, but for this portion, just to look at the network, it is an easy place to look. So right here, you see how much easier it is for you to recognize which systems are most affected in mine when I get to this. So I see the immune system obviously really lit up. And then I can go to other areas and see what other parts are lit up in here. So that's another way that you can look at them and you can see which areas are really affected, signaling by hippocampus, homeostasis, right? Um, so the program cell death right here, you see a very specific area of program cell death lighting up and I can go in there and see what is it. It's the release of apoptotic factor from mitochondria. Guess which one? PCL2, right? So I know that because I know the pathway, but you don't necessarily know that unless you've gone through that PowerPoint um, or remember that, but that's how you would be finding those 10 proteins that you're gonna be putting into putting together in your systems. So let me go back to my other way because uh, actually this is the way that we are gonna be looking at. Um, just making sure everyone able to see some networks, yes. So this is a good part, good, uh, a point to start building that diagram that you're going to be building to turn in for this assignment. And that's going to be a PowerPoint slide with your pathways. Okay. And so I already had a little bit built out uh, the other day. I don't want to necessarily show you like this. I can make it again. Um, so the first thing you want to put in there is your nodes and you want to color code them based on the expression. So maybe I want to do, you know, all my down-regulated nodes as green, let's say, right? Let me make some color choices here. So I go to home. I wanna make sure that I have some colors going on or blue, what about, what about blue? Yeah, let's do blue, right? And I'm gonna have my up-regulated nodes as greens or reds. And then these are my nodes. And so this is what I wanna put in. That's part one. Everyone must show their nodes and whether they were up or down regulated as part of their image. Again, this is a group assignment between you pair. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in. This is gonna be my starting point. Another thing I wanna make sure that I'm gonna put in here is the condition and the supplement that I'm working with. So we know what exactly is the system that you're working with, right? So make sure that you have that in there somewhere in there too. I'm not gonna put it in quite yet. And then I'm going to go ahead and start building out my pathway by first adding my nodes. I don't have to make them rectangles. You can make them any shape you want. You can make them triangles, triangles, whatever. It's, you can be as creative as you want. So I'm going to have immune system as one of my nodes. And this one was, you know, it's B cell lymphoma. So of course it exists. Then I'm going to have my program cell death, which I know is down-regulated, right? 
So I'm going to color code it according to my system again. And I, you know, I'm going to keep the shape consistent just to be a little bit uh, consistent about it. consistency is important, but uh, and the color coding the same. And then my third one was cell cycle, and we know that's upregulated, so I'm going to color code it accordingly. And I may move them around. It doesn't mean that I, I'm I'm not you know necessarily married to the location that I'm putting these in. They may move to very different places eventually. They may move to different areas of the slide. But this is just to start building out the parts that are going to be part of my pathway at the end of the day. Okay, so this one's uh, going to be red. There you go. So this is the first part of your assignment that you must have your notes. You must have your expression up or down. You must have your three networks that you're going to be talking about inside your pathway analysis. Got it? And you know, the other day when I was doing it, I did slightly different color mechanisms. That's fine too. Up to you. Whatever colors you choose, whatever designs you choose. Okay. So so far so good. This is another way that you can show it inside your poster uh, as an additional figure as part of your. You know, some of you had those beautiful. I saw uh, figures with all your molecular markers. You could have this in, in, uh, along with it as one of the panels to show that the different networks that are affected by your particular supplement in your particular uh, condition. You don't have to use it. You can if it's very dramatic or very interesting, that's fine. So here I'm just showing you basically the things that were affected, right? Um, so this was my full image with all the different networks that could possibly have been affected inside that cell. But when I look at the combination of nodes that I have provided at Reactome, the ones that are most majorly affected are the immune system cell cycle program cell death, and then obviously gene expression and cell response to stimuli, a few of the other ones, right? And so that's what you want to have as your second step, some idea about that. The next step is going to be to find those individual pathways and nodes to develop your actual image. So here is an example of uh, some of those starting points. So here I have an image of a DLBCL pathway analysis. This is a basic one. This is not to the level that you need. You need more than this. This is just the most basic. It has my most important nodes. It has BCL2, it has MIC, right? It has PI3K, uh, AKT, BCL10, and, you know, so it has just those basic nodes that I have to have because they are part of my pathway. And it shows just in lines, anytime there's a green arrow, that means that process is uh, expressed, it induces that process. Anytime there's this black arrow with the line, it shows inhibition of that expression. So it's just showing the most basic structure. This would be a beginning, diagram to start working with. But obviously you need to have a lot more details inside. So where would you find those details? There are two places to find those details. One is in the Reactome program itself. And the second is through Google. And I'll show you both ways so you can see where and how you would be doing that. So here is an example of the level of detail that you would want to include for your pathway analysis. So for my BCL2, intrinsic apoptotic system, this is the level of detail that I expect to see. I expect to see clearly marked that intrinsic pathway of apoptosis is the one that's affected, that BCL2 in my case is overexpressed, which is leading to inhibition of cytochrome C release, inhibition of this pathway. So there would be a crosshair showing that the BCL2 is getting is down regulating my apoptotic pathway. And then you can sometimes have a skull at the bottom to show apoptosis or lack thereof by putting a cross on top of it. And then once I add my drugs in, it will show that it's going to inhibit that effect and increase the apoptotic level. Okay. So in my case, um, you guys just have one natural supplement. I have a whole drug regimen. So I'm going to just show you an example of how I would bring that into my pathway analysis. In my case, I'm going to get several cycles of the standard RCHOP therapy, which contains a rituximab, which is an antibody against the B cell cells to make them visible to my immune system. 
And then it has three very potent cytotoxic drugs that are going to kill any living thing, including cancer cells. My cancer cells grow five times faster than my normal cells. So hopefully they'll die five times faster than my normal cells. And those are cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, and vincristin. And then prednisone, which is a steroid to modulate immune response as well. In addition, I've also um, in recruited, I've, well, I've also joined a clinical trial, a phase two clinical trial using a PI3K inhibitor because of my BCL2 expression. And that will go concurrent with this, and that will hopefully shut down the survival pathway, shut down the BCL2 overexpression, and make those cells more susceptible to apoptosis. That's my hope. That's what we would think. And then the last thing that they would do is two cycles of a prophylactic high dose of methotrexate, which is another chemo drug that reduces chance of relapse. So not a small, a little bit long road. So just to remind you the drugs and where they would fit in my pathway, rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that binds to B cells through CD20. All the B cells are gonna have that. It's gonna bind to all of them. That means all of them will be targeted by my immune system to die, hopefully. Good ones, bad ones, who cares? They're dying. We kill them first. Then you have cyclophosphamide. This is a alkylating agent. It cross-links the strands of DNA and inhibits DNA replication. So hopefully it's gonna stall cells in S phase and not let them go forward. Another one that's gonna do similar work is um, doxorubicin. It is an intercalating agent, just like the one that you guys used in the lab, ethidium bromide. It goes into the bases, a bit in between the bases in the DNA, and it causes mutations and induces cell death because of DNA damage associated with it. And when Kristen, which is gonna be like your Taxol, it is a tubulin binding agent, it's gonna inhibit uh, formation of microtubules and mitotic spindle. So if a cell still gets through this and still gets through this, hopefully it stalls hair and inhibits mitosis completion and thus kills the cell. Again, gonna kill anything that's doing it. So kill the GI tract, kill the skin cells, kill the hair cells, got it. But hopefully the cancer cells more effectively than normal cells. And then we have the paracyclosib, which is the PI3K inhibitor and the methotrexate, which inhibits nucleotide synthesis, so prevents cell division as well. So here is an example of how I might show it in the form of my pathway. I might make something like this, where I'm showing this as part, you know, so I have that BCL2 side, I would have that still there, and then I would also have a cell kind of showing the my follicular lymphoma cell or a B cell lymphoma cell with all these targets that I care about. Mine wouldn't have all of them. Mine would have the CD20. Mine would have the BCR pi 3 k kinase one. Mine would have the CMIC. And then it would show, okay, paracyclosib is gonna bind hair or you know, rituximab is gonna bind hair to CD20, inhibit this pathway. pi 3 k is gonna bind to paracyclosib and inhibit this pathway. You know, So just the ones that pertain to me, I would add those into my final schematic. Same thing here. So these are the three chemotherapies. So the first two were targeted therapy. They don't cause side effects systemically. And these ones, again, this is the level of detail that I'm looking for, but I'm not looking for them to be individually placed. I want them to be unified into a single cohesive image by you guys. And I'll show you example of student images. So when Kristen, for example, it's gonna affect the microtubule sensitivity checkpoint. It won't let them form the spindle, hopefully cause that death for them. Cyclophosphamide is going to help release cytochrome C, which will down affect the BC, you know, BCL2 is gonna get affected by the PI3K inhibitor. On top of it, cyclophosphamide is gonna call reactive oxygen damage, release cytochrome C, shift that balance, and hopefully kill those cells. And then doxorubicin, again, is another reactive oxygen species uh, producer. It's going to produce a lot of oxidative stress and thus lead to same idea as cyclophosphamide. So here is an example of a unified, pro a unified image at the end of the day where I have my cell membrane, I have my CD20, my toll-like receptor getting induced by the different drugs. I have my P53 pathway probably affected with the CMIC. 
And then, you know, whatever it is that it's affecting downstream, my PI3K AKT pathway that's going to inhibit the P53, increase CMIC, lead to the upregulation of the cell growth. And then wherever the drug inhibits it, I would put in this inhibitory arrows to show that that process is getting stopped to help relieve whatever symptoms I was getting from that path. Okay. So I'll give you some pointers on how you can start building out a plasma membrane and start building those out in just a second. Before that, let me go ahead and show you some student examples from previous semester of some images uh, from their pathways. So here's an example. It's a very good example. Um, in their case, they chose a weird color though. So they were looking at red yeast rice extracts effect on a, a particular pathway. They didn't tell me what pathway, so that's they could, would have gotten points taken off for that. Uh, their main networks were immune system and metabolism, so they would have gotten a point off for not showing three networks. But what they did show is the crosstalk. So at least somewhere in your image, you should have a crosstalk between two networks together. So maybe a node that's present in two different ones that affects both or a pathway that is producing a product that's going into the second network to start off that process. And you'll see examples of those. Um, they chose red for down regulation, which is kind of funny, but um, all their nodes were down regulated and they are showing how they were affected at the immune system and the metabolic level and what the effects were at each end. This is the level of uh, detail that I would be looking for in those pathways. Here's another one. In this case, they had their down-regulated and up-regulated nodes marked right here. Um, they used a slightly different program uh, for some of their pictures, but you can use either way. They're still done in PowerPoints. There are three networks that were looking at disease, metabolism, and vesicle-mediated transport, and they are showing how the product of one is affecting the second, and then that's affecting the third. And in their case, they are looking at insulin resistance and its effect in response to their agent, which they have not marked. So they would have, again, gotten a point off or two points off for that. So make sure that you are putting in not just what disorder, but also what supplement you're working with. Here's another one, a little bit disjointed, but uh, still containing all the information or most of the information that's needed. So they were looking at rheumatoid arthritis with curcumin and, uh, you know, so some of their arrows, because of the way they are organized, can be confusing. So that's something you want to be mindful of. But you can clearly see their nodes that were up and those that were down and what effect they produced. It's very, it is very clear what the response is, that it's rheumatoid arthritis is because of the inflammatory response and curcumin is inhibiting the NF-kappa B, leading to the reduction of that inflammatory response and the osteopontin degradation. Um, this one was a very simple one, and they were missing many, 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 many important points. So that would be something of not to do. Um, they only have two nodes, uh, two, uh, well, they have three different networks, but they're not very well defined, and they are not given in enough detail. So that's their biggest quest issue, and they only told me the compound quercetin, but not what they were looking at. Here is a good one. I like this one. It, again, talks about the different um, systems very well, the different networks that are affected. It gives enough details about them at the bottom. It tells what it was looking at, curcumin's effect on cardiomyopathy pathways, and it has the nodes clearly marked. And this, it would be the right level of active, you know, level of expression you want to show. Another one that is a little simplistic, however, still contains plenty of information. It is done a different way, and it is beautiful in an that as long as it explains what it is that it was doing, where they went wrong. So they don't show about the three different effects it's having, the different pathways. Uh, they don't tell me what net, what compound they're using and what effect or disease they were looking at at the end of the day. I can guess, but I don't know. Um, that was already done. Da, da, da. Here's another one. Um, again, this is clearly marking how one network affects the other and what compounds they were using. So that's good. Um, so yeah, do you guys get an idea? Questions about this part? Last message I have is from like, I'm saying no. 
So actually, I had some really nice ones. I have to find them. There's a couple of them that show like the, you know, they'll show the berries on top along with the active compound, and then they go in further. And those are really good to show it that way because that's very clear then what it, what natural product you were looking at, what active compound you were looking at, and what disease or disorder you were affecting. Okay, question so far. You're good. Guys, talk to me, please. Okay, nobody wants to talk to me. Good. Okay, so let's see. Hmm. How do we make these ourselves, right? Um, so I'm going to teach you how to do this. You know, you can do it in Canvas Studio, Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, whatever. If you know them and you like them, you are free to use any Illustrator software you want uh, or animation software you want. However, I teach in uh, PowerPoint because it's readily available to all of you. Everyone can use it. I've done plenty of publications with images drawn in PowerPoint. And so it's very easy and professionally available uh, thing to do. So let's say, you know, how do I start? Well, I wanna make a cell membrane, let's say. So what I can do is I can make a little phospholipid molecule, right? So I'm gonna make my little circle. I'm gonna use the draw tool and I'm gonna make a little line. I wanna make him straight though. And then I'm going to duplicate it by doing Control D. I'm going to select both of these. I'm going to go to File, not File, sorry, Home, Arrange, Align, Top. So they're at the same level. I'm going to bring him in. So the first one's going to take a bit to get it just right the way I want it. Once I'm happy with him, I'm going to group him. I can make the color different if I want it, right? I could do yellow i could do the shape outline as black or whatever i want once i'm happy with him i can do Control d and duplicate him put him next to each other i can make sure they're aligned arrange align top i can then do Control d right i can select all of them I can say arrange, align, top. Look at that, how beautiful. And I have my little membrane. I can group it. I can control D. Now I could make layer, right? I could make a 3D structure if I wanted by placing them kind of along on top of behind each other. And I can make this one a little bit lighter yellow. And then the one in front, even a little lighter. Right. And you can make a 3D structure like that, right? That can happen. You can also, if you don't want to make that much of a 3D effect, it's sometimes cool, sometimes not, right? You can, if you want to, you can group it and you can do the other side of it over here. And then you can put a receptor in the middle, right? I can also arrange and group. I can also just keep it single and just have it like this, right? Um, now, obviously that's not how normally cells are. They need that other side. So they're lipid bilayers. So I can make a lipid bilayer right here. I just rotate it. Right, make sure it's aligned properly. Right, and again, you know, I changed the colors right now because I had the different layers, but I don't have to, I can keep them the same. And then I can put my different stuff in there. So arrange, group, let me make the colors all the same for this one, just to be simple. I can make it smaller, larger, thinner, heavier, whatever I need. I usually make them bigger than I want, and then I can always, you know, at the end, make them smaller to fit the needs of my system. Um, let's say I want an antibody receptor here, right? Because I have the CD20, blah, 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 that I want to show binding to the rituximab. So I could do 
something like this. And again, I will make them first and then I will change their size according to my needs. And then uh, home. No, 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 go back. So maybe I want to have like the tank here. I can move it down. And uh, put it the way I want it. I accidentally made the mistake, just do control Z. That needs to be a little Right. And this button needs to be closer anyway. There. And then I can select it and I can say if this was the one that I wanted, I would just group it. I would change the color to whatever I wanted. Let's say I wanted this color, right? So, you know, you can make it as sophisticated and as similar or as different you want. Maybe this needs to be a little bit in because it's gonna have a phosphorylation in here. Then it gets activated maybe. And so maybe I'll put, you know, always a little green dot as a phosphorylation. I will write that in my little legend once I get to that, that the green, small things are phosphorylations, for example, right? So maybe this is gonna get phosphorylated to get activated, who knows? And so that's how you would start to build them out, right? Um, and then you would work through that. I want to buy my rituximab molecule. So some of the times I can look up the molecule's shape and structure and I can make it myself. Maybe I don't wanna be that intricate and I want to be a little bit lazier, right? You can also, for your arrows, you just use these arrows to show the effect. You make them thicker and thinner by using the different weights, by changing the color as needed, right? You can make them uh, change different directions. You can do whatever you need to do to make them look the way you want. You can have them go one way or another. You can make them dashed or simple as you need it. You can also use these bigger, thicker arrows to be more, you know, elaborate or to be more uh, sexy or cool. It's up to you. There are also other places that you can find uh, icons, and I'm going to show you a great place, a great resource in Reactum. So you can go to reactum.org, go to the main site, and you're going to go all the way down. And there's this place called Icon Library. It's super, super cool place. You're gonna love it. Alec, what are you laughing about, man? I just saw you happening. So guess what you can find here? You can go to arrows. Look at that. So if you're showing me a pathway and you're gonna miss a few mediators, so any pathway that you're gonna show me, I want you to show at least the starting input signal, the receptor it's binding to, and two or three mediators underneath before the effect. Sometimes there are many, many steps in between that you're not showing. You want to show an arrow like this, a broken up arrow to show that there are steps that you're not showing. If you can use red for upregulation, for example, blue for inhibition, doesn't matter. You don't have to use those colors. You can use different colors or just black. It's fine too. But arrows with open you know, edge like this, an arrow process is going to mean in, in that that process is induced, it's happening. A straight line means inhibition of that process. If the drug is going to block that ha from happening, whether it is the induction or suppression, you put a cross on top of that line to indicate that that process is gonna be inhibited now by your supplement, for example. So this is any one of these, you can just go in, you can download the PNG file, and then you can include them in your system. You just insert it like a normal thing. It's so cool. No, no, no. You just have to put the notes, but you also have to put like, you know, something. Let's say you use a specific molecule, like a small circle, green circle for, phosph uh, uh, for phosphorylation. Then you want to indicate that in your legend because uh, you don't want to write phosphates in each one of them, right? Or you can, but it might make it too busy. So just utilize that legend to inc to add some of that info if you need it. So anyway, so insert from this device, I just downloaded that little arrows just to show you how cool and easy it goes. 
I put it in. There it is. Now I can use it any way I want and I can rotate it. I can make it bigger, smaller. Life is great. It's just like I did it myself, right? Um, even more cool, this is just arrows, right? We just went to the arrows. Look at what else they've got. They have cell elements. They have cell types. They have adherence, mitochondria, damaged DNA, good DNA. They have nuclear pore complex, apoptosome. You name it, they've got it. They have a lot of different icons. These are all for creating and sharing. There is no need for any, there's no copyright infringement. That's what they're there for. Um, you can certainly write down that that's what you're doing is taking it from Reactome, but there is even no need for it. And so again, you'll find all kinds of different tissues. See human tissue component. They even have a baby now. I don't know why. They suddenly have all these babies in here. Um, but they have different systems. They have different um, compounds. They have cell types. They have cell elements. They have receptors and proteins. And these are made according to their structure, 3D structural cartoon schematic version. So you can use any of these in CD4, right? I could have taken this and made my own CD20. They're, I'm sure CD20 is one of them too. I could have just picked it out. And so any one of these, you just go in, you download the PNG, you incorporate it into your uh, system. That's all you would need to do to draw out your pathways, okay? Does that help? Look at this. Look at those transporters. They're so cute, right? They have aquaporins. They have calcium channels. They have symporters, antiporters, uniporters, you name it. So they've got a lot of really good resources for you to utilize without having to go completely crazy over it, right? You don't have to stress out on trying to make every single thing. You can find a lot of stuff right here. Okay, questions. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and open your breakout room so you can go in and work on your project for a little bit, at least for an hour. I would like you to stay there and Start building out your pathway. Make sure that you understand that you don't have any questions from me. Um, I'm going to just make them uh, the breakout rooms and say, you know, you can join them yourselves. Just go with your own partner and just go into one of the rooms that is available. Right. And I'll come by and answer any questions that you have. Just raise your hand. <coughs> Sounds good. Okay, dears, uh, the rooms are now open. You should be able to go there. 